Hi friends. A few of you have asked me to do a quick run through of the coil and so we've got a beautiful Easter Sunday here in the Midwest and I figured I'd just go over the basic functions and the components of my Tessa coil. I wanted to start over here first though and really quick show you the rings which I have been fabricating over the last month or so and will hopefully go into the construction of a new Torrid. That's basically 14 rings which are going to be joined to their equal counterpart and it, eh, that's a lot of work but with luck that'll be done later this summer. Anyway coming over here the whole thing starts in this area. This is what I like to call the umbilical cord. It's a 240 volt fused dedicated outlet which comes out of the basement and is rated at 100 amps. Through this cable which winds around on the floor coming over here to the first stop the power variac. The power variac is rated at 20 kVA and I'm inputting 240 volts. It is activated by two contactors each of which taking one pole of the phase legs and making continuity to the transformer inside. From the variac the next stop are the inductors and I say inductors because I actually have an inductor bank which serves to choke the current on my coil and it consists of six 1000 watt metal halide ballasts that have had the magnetic shunts knocked out of them. Each one of these six cells is submerged in a pot which is filled with mineral oil and that oil is primarily used to insulate the inductors in the event that there's any short circuits or transient voltages which might work their way back up the system. From the inductors the electricity is then fed into this big box which I affectionately call the toy box. Inside of here are six small potential transformers and those are wired in a series parallel configuration so that the output of that unit when fed with 240 volts will deliver 14.4 kV. Over here are the controls which are used to modulate the phasing on the synchronous spark gap as well as provide a small voltage boost for the synchronous motor that I use in the Tesla coil. When I had originally upgraded my electrode size from one quarter inch to three eighth inch tungsten, the problem I encountered was that my synchronous motor was no longer strong enough or capable of spinning that tungsten rod at 3600 RPM. As a consequence it would fall out of synchronicity and the whole coil would go into asynchronous mode. That's bad. So I was able to secure a 50 Hertz permanent magnet synchronous motor from a seller on eBay. The motor was originally used for applications uh, designed for the military overseas. Getting to the long and short of it, what that enabled me to do because the motor was rated at 50 hertz and I'm feeding it with 60 hertz, the reactance of the motor is slightly higher than what a 60 hertz motor would be. By applying an over voltage of about 20%, I could get the necessary current to drive the motor at its rated torque. But because horsepower is a function of torque as well as speed or angular velocity, I was able to gain more horsepower because I'm spinning it at 3600 RPM rather than 3000 RPM. A long-winded explanation for something which really doesn't make sense to me, but it works and I'm happy about it and we're going to move on. This is the phase controller which is a modified variac and it is turned into a variable inductor. In front of the phase controller is a small box which is filled with a number of capacitors. Those capacitors are used to counteract the inductive reactance of this variac or this variable inductor when we vary the phase. That provides resonance and voltage boost so that the voltage being supplied to the synchronous motor remains within an operational level. If we didn't have these minute we started to imply our inductance we would see the phase fall back or out of 
out of, out of synchronicity with the source that's feeding it, but we would also experience a significant voltage loss. That would be bad. So that's what this does. The way to figure out the amount of capacitance needed for this application is done through nothing but trial and error. Moving forward, the, this is my fancy pointer. It's a screwdriver. So if it, yeah. Anyway, this is the, the cable that feeds the voltage source to the, to the spark gap motor, the synchronous motor, which was that motor, uh, if you remember that I said operates it, it, it's a 50 hertz motor that's operating at 60 hertz on an over voltage of about 20 percent. That goes to the coil and we'll walk down there in a minute and get to that. From the transformer box or the toy box as I so affectionately call it, if you want to come over here, we have a set of high voltage cables and these are electrically bonded to the output of the transformer bank in its purest form, if I weren't to connect any load or reactive load of uh, power on the other end of this, the voltage potential between these two insulators would be 14.4 thousand. Inside the tank circuit of the Tesla coil, I am utilizing an amount of capacitance which reacts with the inductors back at the beginning of this circuit and, be, and because of that reaction through this transformer bank, we see a resonant rise voltage boost of almost twice as much electricity or voltage as what we started with. That, that essentially amounts to about 30,000 volts. That voltage is fed through these primary cables or these high voltage cables, which are white, and it goes down to the body of the Tesla coil itself. Moving into the tank circuit of the Tesla coil, if you wanna come and take a look at this, the control cable, which was used to modulate the phasing or the positioning of the rotor on the motor is right here. That's plugged into this receptacle and this cable itself is shielded and bonded with a braided ground that is not interconnected electrically to the powertrain back at the beginning of the circuit. That ground is bonded right here into this braided strap, which then exits the unit to either side into a grounding grid on either side, which I'll explain in a moment. The two high voltage primary cables, I call them primary because I associate high voltage with primary, uh, being that I'm a lineman. I guess technically these would be secondary cables, but that to me makes no sense. So I'm gonna call them primary. Are connected to the spark gap, which is located right in here. And those two metallic balls are spaced at a distance of about four tenths of an inch, about a centimeter. And that gives me a breakdown when the voltage between those two, uh, those two spheres exceeds about 28,000 volts, which is about where I want it. The motor, which is located back in there, and I can't reach in here because I have large ballistic plexiglass shields over this, is a propeller style. I'm not utilizing a disc style rotor. I found that with the type of motor I'm using, being that it is a true synchronous motor, and the fact that it worked so well within the framework of what it was designed to run at, the propeller gap was a much easier gap to fabricate, and I've had tremendous success with it. That is a 3 8 inch pure tungsten rod, 12 inches long. That motor spins at 3,600 RPM, which if you do the math, means that the tip speed on that, uh, that rotor, that tungsten rod, is somewhere around 137 to 140 miles an hour, give or take. That's off the top of my head. I may be in error about that, but I think it's fairly accurate. The two electrodes on either side of that tungsten rod are the short circuit electrodes that are used to channel the electricity into the primary coil up here when those capacitors in the back are charged. The whole tank circuit is wrapped in one half inch plexiglass ballistic shielding. In case we were to have some sort of catastrophic failure in here, I wouldn't want the ejection of metallic parts moving at velocities of about 140 miles an hour. That would be bad. Tungsten happens to be very heavy. If you look at a periodic table, 
it's way down there at the bottom by uranium and plutonium and thallium and, and gold and lead and all that stuff. So we want to keep that stuff in here. Moving around to the back of the unit, the capacitors I'm using are the coveted Maxwell power caps, pulse discharge, high voltage, 40 kV. I have three cells in here. I don't remember specifically what each cell is rated at, but the total capacitance of this bank is 250 nanofarads. We have a break rate of 120 breaks per second. That's synchronous, that's what's called a slow break rate Tesla coil. And 250 nanofarads of capacitance is about as much as I can possibly cram into this thing without creating a wormhole. Remember, these capacitors are resonating to a certain extent with the inductors back at the beginning of the circuit through the coils of the transformer. When I originally designed the circuit, I had intended to use math as a way to figure out how to get about a 70 to 80 percent resonation rate between these two, and I found that the the differential equations that were involved in calculating those numbers were absolutely impossible to solve with pen and paper. And You'd need MATLAB or something like that, which I don't know. So to try to numerically crunch the numbers on this like an engineer would do, it's just about impossible. To make matters even worse, you have a resonation that's occurring between the coils of a transformer bank, and those transformers have iron cores in them. And as you increase the current flowing through those transformers, you saturate the cores. So we have partial saturation of the cores of the transformer, which changes the reactance of those cores. And in, in so doing, it makes trying to figure out the relationship between these two specifically all but impossible. If you can do it, please let me know. I'd be happy to find out. Moving up, the primary coil is, I believe, 3 8 inch refrigerating refrigerator tubing. We are tapped right now at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7. Okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 turns. And that's relatively low. That's a low tapping point for a Tesla coil, at least I think it is, but we're working with so much capacitance in the bottom of this thing that that's the tapping point necessary to create the resonance between the secondary circuit and the primary circuit. The secondary coil or the form is a 12 inch PVC tube ID. The outer diameter on that is 12.75 inches. I have about 1200 turns of number 18 heavy build magnet wire, which is a coil length of somewhere around, I think 50 to 52 inches. Don't remember off the top of my head, but it might be somewhere around there. It's about 28 ohms of wire resistance from the bottom to the top. That is wrapped in multiple layers of heavy duty, heavy duty high voltage electrical tape. I did want to do the fancy dancy 20 something coats of polyurethane varnish on there and get a beautiful gold secondary form on this. I tried it. What I found out was that the power levels I was delivering to this coil were so high that any small miscalculation in the phasing or the frequency balance between the top and the bottom caused bad things to happen on this. And the only way to contain that type of electrical energy was to just wrap the heck out of this thing with thick electrical tape. That has by and large solved my problem. It may not be as aesthetically pleasing, but I'll tell you folks, when you run this thing at night and you've got this big black form here with the blue ultraviolet spark coming down, it actually looks very good because it's, it, it does not reflect light, so it tends to make the whole surroundings a lot brighter, but I might be biased in that opinion. The Torrid is a standard HVAC flex tube. That's 14 inch. The outer diameter on that is approaching 60 inches. The center plate that I use to support that is made out of a, drum roll please, 30 inch pizza pan, if I remember correctly. Uh, ordered off of Amazon, our good friends at Amazon. And like I said before at the beginning of this video, with luck, that ring toward in there will be finished by the middle of the summer. I hope I'm not jinxing myself, but that should add the final touch and a beautiful top piece and top load to this Tesla coil. Uh, last point of interest that I wanted to make note of on this was the grounding system. The grounding system, I've taken uh, extra steps and a large amount of effort to make sure that we have 
adequate grounding for this machine. I have two wires coming off and exiting to the sides of this coil. Um, these wires are electrically connected to the strike rail, which is non-continuous around the top due to the fact that you don't want to get circulating currents in here when the coil is running. The makeshift Faraday cage that's created by the inclusion of these straps just uses is used to channel that electricity down into those ground wires. Those ground wires exiting off to either side and this is a mirror image of the other side are connected to a ground rod. That's an eight foot ground rod driven to its maximum length. From this ground rod we have two exiting wires underground, you can't see them, that go in either direction for a length of 12 feet, whereupon they are attached to two more ground rods. Those ground rods are eight feet. We have the same thing on that side. So we have a total of six ground rods at eight feet long for 48 feet in the ground. The ground is well sufficient to handle what it is that we're asking of it. All of these wires have been inserted or threaded through PVC clear tubing. The ground wires, the main power cable, the control cable, I found that that was necessary because during operation those cables were drawing the attention of the streamers and the discharges from the top of the coil. It wasn't creating problems insofar as damaging things electrically because all of these cables are high quality and they're shielded with a braid but it was distracting from the intention that I wanted the coil to provide which was to exit go as far as possible and then hit the ground. We're gonna run tonight with luck we tried to run last night and we sheared a pin on the motor that's since been replaced thankfully I'm going to place a GoPro camera on the pavement in uh, this vicinity. It'll be caged in a chicken wire, but the front will be open, and with luck we will uh, see the GoPro get hit by strikes, which should be a good effect. And if everything goes to plan, it should be a good show. Hope that does it.